I want to introduce uh, Brenda Diesick. She's uh, an advanced master gardener, author, conservationist, and butterfly activist. Among her many accomplishments, she founded Brenda's Butterfly Habitat in Westland, which is a Greenland hosting thousands of native Michigan butterflies. It's open to the public. Uh, she's written a book called Raising Butterflies in the Garden, right here, copies for sale on the counter if you'd like one, uh, in which she shares her experience and gives people practical guidance on how to help butterflies and moths thrive at their own homes. Um, she's the co-founder and president of the Southeast Michigan Butterfly Association, and she's been named Wayne County's Master Gardener of the Year by the Michigan State University Extension. At the national level, she's a two-time winner of the President's Volunteer Service Award. She also received a Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award and a Certificate of Special Congressional Recognition from the U.S. House of Representatives. Brenda's goal is to educate people about pollinating insects like butterflies and moss, native plants, and their importance to the ecosystem, and then to give people the skills and knowledge to raise those plants and butterflies at their homes. Please help me give a warm lunch and learn welcome to our speaker today, Brenda Diesick. So, um, yep, today I want to share some information on many different species of butterflies and moths in our area. Um, I want to just give you a little background on them and, you know, um, the plants that the caterpillars need. So we're going to just cover a talk on this. Um, I've been doing this for a couple of years and I, I'm very passionate about helping our ecosystem out. Um, when you're done, if you want, I brought some giant swallowtail caterpillars in the biggest habitat. Um, in the one next to it, um, two moths came out this morning, so I brought them. There's a Promethea and a Luna. And then in the other um, cage are red spotted purple caterpillars, so you can look at those. Um, if any of you do would be interested in raising um, any, I do have habitats for sale along with the books. Um, so help yourself looking at um, the little critters I brought in after we get done speaking today. So we're going to talk about now the native plants that these species need. Okay. First of all, before you can plant for butterflies and moths in your area, you need to know what species are in your area. So you can ask people like me, um, you know, there's a lot of Facebook groups that have information. So there's a lot of available information that you can obtain. Um, this is a good website to go to if you want to find out what butterflies and moths are in your area. It's butterfliesandmoths.org. Up in the top, you'll see regional checklist. So once you go spe species profile, then you go to re regional checklist. After you do that, you'll see this over on the left hand side, it will say species type. So you can put in butterfly, you can put in moth, or you can put in both. Then you'll s select the region, the state, and the county. And I'm sorry, I have Oakland County in here. Um, I should have changed this to Wayne County. Um, you then hit apply. After you hit apply, you'll get a long list of butterfly names. Um, in the turquoise blue, that's the Latin name, and if you click that on, it will show that species, it will show you where that species is. You know, if you have a summer home in some other state, you can apply this to that, so you can also plant a butterfly garden there. And it will tell you all the information you need. It will give you the host plants. Um, it will tell you, you know, um, the adult food. It will tell you a description of that species. So that's very useful in planting a butterfly garden no matter where you live. This is what my house used to look like before. And occasionally I would see a cabbage white flutter through. So um, when I got married in 2000, this is what my husband had for a backyard. Um, but I had other plans. So um, this is what it looks, well not now, in a, in a, give it a month because the plants are just coming up. But this was last summer. This is my um, 
garden now, um, my backyard. So I just have little paths of grass that go around the gardens. And I incorporate as many host plants as possible to attract as many different uh, species as possible. Well, I ran out of backyard. So what's one to do? Well, this is what my husband's front yard used to look like before. <laughs> and um, it just had these old shrubs in it, and that's great for Japanese beetles, I mean, um, but that isn't what I wanted to attract. I started working on the front yard, and well, we got rid of the bushes and you know, just put in plants that were butterfly friendly. So that was my front yard. Okay, now we'll go ahead and talk about, you know, the plants that you need for a butterfly moth garden. Most of the plants need full sun, so try to find an area that has at least six hours of sun each day. And of course, you want to water your plants um, until the roots are established, but when you're using native plants, they've evolved without our help for thousands of years. So you really don't need to water them. Um, also, you don't need to fertilize them. So you really save a lot of money by using native plants. And this just shows why native plants are so important. Um, if you have a drought, look how deep the root system is. And then you'll see over here, um, well, it worked for a second. I don't know what's going on here. But way over on the left, you'll see there is the Kentucky bluegrass and how short that um, root system is. So because I love to do photography and I collect the eggs when the butterflies lay them, um, I try to have the majority of my taller plants in the back and the shorter ones in the front, um, you know, it, even like in my book, I think 450 of those pictures are mine. Um, but when I see a butterfly, or, well, usually I don't see the moth doing it, but, um, well, sometimes, like the snowberry. Some of them I do, the uh, diurnal ones, because a lot of your moths are nocturnal, but um, there are diurnal ones. So when you see a butterfly touching its host plant and it curls its abdomen, you know it's laying an egg. So I run out there and get those eggs before there's any chance of, you know, ants or, um, there's so many different predators that get them. Um, so I go and collect them and bring them in the house and I raise some. So just to ensure I still have lots of butterflies in the yard. Also, you want to plant your um, plants in groups because if you're doing smaller plants and you just plant one um, and the butterfly comes and lays a couple eggs on it, that caterpillar is not going to have enough food to complete its whole metamorphosis. So also, um, butterflies and moths are, you know, they're nearsighted, so if you have a larger group, of course you don't have to put like great big bushes in groups, you know, but um, your smaller plants, it's easier for them to see. Also, your host plants, you want to have those in multiple locations because if I just have maybe three swamp milkweed plants here and nowhere else, and a predator comes to that plant, it will probably eliminate everything it sees on it. But if you have swamp milkweed here and then maybe have some over here, um, it's less chance of predation. So that will ensure that you'll have the species. Butterflies and moths are cold-blooded, so if they have something they can cool their self on um, that helps them to fly. Also, sometimes um, I've seen the butterflies when it's cooler and they'll go like this, and they vibrate their wing muscles, um, you know, and that will heat them up so they can fly too. So here we have a picture of a painted lady on Mr. Toad, and we have a monarch here on the Monarch Way Station. Oh, I guess it won't, I see it shows up here, but it won't show up on the screen, that's weird. Anyways, um, and I'm number one on the first Monarch Way Station in Michigan, 
and number 45 in the United States. I also keep overripe fruit because there's many species that like to feed on overripe fruit. Um, they'll also feed on dung and carrion, but I don't keep that in the yard. Um, you know, but I do keep fruit. Um, that, that's okay. And, and um, you can see here, I keep watermelon, and this watermelon looks kind of gross, but they don't mind. Um, and, and not that I'm cheap, but I am in some things. And um, so I like to get things that don't cost that much money. So I buy a big watermelon, and I can cut it in a slice and leave it out there for a week where it gets really funky and they don't care. Then throw that away, then I can get another piece, and you know, so I can get at least three hunks out of it. So I do that um, you know, for my butterflies and moths. Another thing I do is I, I'll put watermelon in a suet thing and hang that up, but I take bananas. And I save my orange bags, and the bananas curve like this, and I leave the skin on. And then I just take my fingernail and I make a slice down the side just so there's a little opening. And by leaving that banana skin on, I can use that whole banana for a week. Now talk about saving money. <laughs> so, and you can see I've got a um, Viceroy on the watermelon and there's a red, um, red Admiral and a question mark on the banana. So this is ways I used to do it. Um, and, it and you can still do it this way if you want. Um, you know, I used to take the pill off the banana, but it gets hard really fast. Um, and then I used to not eat all the cantaloupe and you know give it to the butterflies. And I've got a red spot of purple. And you'll see the caterpillars over there. But down, oh, this one here, <laughs> the um, blue one, that's a red spot of purple. And that's what uh, those caterpillars will look like when they're adults. And the um, morning cloak is on the bottom. Well, I guess it's the left-hand corner, no matter which way you're looking. That's a morning cloak. That's one of our longest living butterflies that can live up to 12 months. In the middle, that's a Nessa sphinx, and that's a sphinx moth, and it's feeding on the watermelon. Also, um, a place to puddle. Um, you know, butterflies and moths, they get sodium and potassium um, out of the damp mulch and sand and and you know, and that provides them minerals that are uh, vital for reproduction. Um, also, the water converts the sugar, you know, fats um, to sugars which aid in their flights. So here in the top left corner, we have a spice bush swallowtail and it's puddling and we have a painted lady in the top right corner. The bottom left, we have a silver spotted skipper, and in the bottom right, we have a wild indigo dusky wing. And the majority of the time, it will be the males that are puddling. You know, the, the females will too, you know, so it converts the fats into sugars so they can fly, but the majority of the time, it's males because when they mate, they deposit a sperm sac within the female, and then each time she lays the egg, it passes through that and fertilizes. But before he can mate again, he has to replenish, you know, the sodium and potassium and everything so that he can provide that to another female. So we'll just cover a few nectar plants. Um, they are important food uh, for the butterflies, and they contain the carbohydrates and amino acids that are necessary for reproduction. So here's a, a few of the native uh, plants. We have the orange coneflower, and we have a prairie phlox, and a wild bergamot. And we have the silver spotted skipper. We have, whoops, the, I'm telling you the bu butterfly instead of the host plant. Um, the Canadian goldenrod, the common milkweed, and the New, Ang New England aster. And this is black-eyed Susan and swamp milkweed. And that um, little buddy there on the swamp milkweed, that's a hummingbird clearwing moth. And the moth underneath it, that's a yellow-scaped, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm having a senior moment right now. 
trust me, it's a moth. <laughs> and we have um, butterfly weed. Here we have um, wild geranium and some more swamp milkweed and San Coryopsis. I got the guy on there again. Okay, we have sweet williams and the moth up on the top. That's a white spotted sable moth. And we have ironweed. So there are quite a few moths that are diurnal. Um, some of your bigger, well, depends on what sphinx it is, but like with the Luna that you'll see over there in, um, in the cage, you're, those are really nocturnal and you only see those at nighttime. This is what I feel is most important if you want to have a butterfly and moth garden because if you don't have the host plants, a butterfly or moth will come through the yard to nectar, but the female will want to be where there's places where she can lay her eggs and the, and the young can live. And a lot of the butterflies and moths will hang out in that area and patrol waiting for the female. So it's really important. And the host plants are what they lay their eggs on and the caterpillars feed on. So these are some of the trees that I have in my yard. Um, I, you know, I have tulip on poplar, wild black cherry, hop tree, nanaberry viburnum, and the chinkapin oak. And I also have a bunch of trees in pots because um, I ran out of room in my yard, so I have them along my driveway. And the ones that I have in pots in the winter, I put them behind my house and I pack, and actually more than this, um, but I pack leaves and mulch, um, usually just tons of leaves, in between each pot and on top of them. And they're in a thick pot anyways, which helps um, protect their roots. Um, you know, so they don't die. And, and um, by insulating them more with all the dead leaves and everything around them, it helps protect their roots. And still when it rains or snows, they're still getting moisture. And then in the spring, I just get my dolly and I move them back to the driveway. Now for the trees that are in my yard, I don't want a shade garden, I want a sun garden. So um, each fall, before there's a chance of frost coming in. I cut my trees down. I used to do it like two feet. I'm, now I'm doing it three feet, um, just because I want leaves a little bit sooner. It, it will work at two feet. Um, but th this picture of these trees, I did it um, two feet. But now I cut them down at three feet, and then instead of a tulip poplar tree that's 80 to 100 feet tall, I keep it brindicized, and I call it brindicized because I'm not the tallest person. And um, at the end of the season, all I have to do is get my six-foot step ladder. I can climb up on there, and I can find any egg or caterpillar that's on there. So um, I do that with all, all my trees. And then they kind of bush out, so instead of a tree, you kind of have a bush tree. So you have a lot more leaves to feed all those caterpillars and, and, um, with. So now we're going to talk about some of the butterflies and moths that you can attract to your garden. So first we'll talk about the monarch. And this one here is a male. Um, the male on its hind wing, it has these two black spots here um, next to its abdomen. And um, those are scent glands. The female does not have those. So this is what a monarch egg looks like. Um, it's 1 32nd of an inch. And early in the season, you know, a lot of your books will say, oh, they lay their eggs underneath a leaf. Well, honey, let me tell you, they lay them under, on top, on the stems. And when there's tight flower buds, they lay in the flower buds. So um, I find a lot of mine right in the tight flower buds early in the season. Now, the monarchs only feed on plants in the Asclepius family, and that's the milkweed family. So some of the um, native ones in this area are butterfly weed, common milkweed, poke milkweed, and swamp milkweed. 
So I show what the caterpillar looks like when it first comes out of, you know, its eggs, it's three thirty seconds of an inch. And then I show in the last end star, and it's close to two inches then. And when it sheds its skin, the butterf a lot of parts of the butterfly are already underneath the skin. Um, it has all insects have three pair of true legs, and these are the true legs uh, you know, on its thorax. Then these other things that help it grow are its pro legs, and they're just um, you know, appendages that help it to move. But when it sheds its skin, it will already have the wing pads formed underneath there, its antenna, um, its proboscis, and it will, the other, Parts will liquefy, the molecules will rearrange, it will lose the pro legs, it will develop a reproductive system, and all that takes place. And in a monarch, depending on daylight hours and temperatures, it averages nine to 10 days for the rest of that metamorphosis to complete, and then it will eclose, and you'll have the beautiful monarch. So this is my butterfly weed. And this is common milkweed, which I used to have in these beautiful black pots that somebody threw out. Um, and I put saucers underneath it because I have a really, have you seen how little my yard is, really little. And um, the common milkweed, it's wonderful because it has great big huge leaves, so there's a lot of food for them to eat. But it does have underground rhizomes that would travel 12 to 14 feet and just pop up all over. And because I just can't, you know, I, I like things in a certain spot here and there, and I didn't want it to take over my yard. So I used to have it in between my garage and my neighbor's fence there so I could find the eggs, but I no longer have that. But it's a wonderful plant if you have the room to put it, if you don't mind it popping up, or you know, whatever. It's a great plant to have, and the flowers smell awesome. This one I do have, this is poke milkweed, and this is a shade-loving plant. And I have lots and lots of swamp milkweed. Um, this just has a regular little root system, um, you know, this kind of goes down like this. It's not very deep. Um, and it doesn't spread only by seeds. So if you don't want it spreading in your yard, just cut off the seed pods at the end of the season. Um, I usually will deadhead this once and I'll get a second bloom out of it. So when the flowers are spent, I just cut them off and I get a second bloom out of them. But even though it's a perennial, it's not a long living perennial. So every fall, I let some of the seed pods open up and fall because I always want new plants coming up. But you know, whether you do or, or not, you know, it's your own situation. This is a black swallow towel. And this is a female. She has a lot of blue on her hind wing. And the male, a lot of times, will have, uh, well, it will have two rows of dots, and they'll be a yellow color. And the black swallowtail eggs are about, oh, 1 32nd of an inch, and they're always a round ball. And these are the different stages of um, the caterpillar, and you can see um, when it first comes out, it's dark brown with a cream saddle, and then the next picture you see it shedding its skin, so its face capsule has come off, so its face looks really pale, but it, it will darken up, and you can see the skin between, um, in, well, actually, um, you can see its exoskeleton. It isn't actually skin, it's exoskeleton. Um, a lot of people say skin but you can see the exoskeleton behind it because they can only grow so big in the exoskeleton and then they have to shed it and then they can get bigger. And they can vary in color and then the very last uh, picture, the green one, that's right before it makes its chrysalis. And their host plant, their native host plant is Golden Alexanders. So this is my Golden Alexanders. This is the American Lady and I've already been collecting some eggs and caterpillars of that. Um, so they're up in the area right now. And these eggs are very little. Um, I only collected, I think, two eggs because 
When I started doing this over 20 years ago, these butterflies, I think, they used to lay bigger eggs because I didn't need my glasses to see them. Well, then they start laying them a little bit smaller, so then I had to wear glasses with bifocals. And you know what? Now they're even laying them smaller. Now I have to wear my bifocals and a magnifying glass, and sometimes I can't see them anyhow. So um, I think they're just doing that to me. I don't know if y'all will have that same experience or not, but um, I think they're just doing that to me, just to keep me on my toes. But they're like 1 64th of an inch. They're very little. So this is, these, these are plants that they lay their eggs on, the pearly everlasting, pussy toes, and sweet everlasting. But how I've been collecting the caterpillars, this is my best way now. When they start um, hatching, all caterpillars produce, uh, they have a spinneret that produces silk. And they stitch the leaf together. See the picture on the left? How the, the, it looks like a mess on that leaf. Well, they've stitched that leaf together to protect themselves from predators. And when I see that, I know there's a caterpillar in there, so I don't have to look for those goofy eggs. Um, so then I just, um, so I went out and collected me some of those yesterday, because um, I'm like, okay, now I see you. Because I've seen her in the garden laying the eggs, but I'm like, where did you lay them? And, and two of them, I actually kept my eye on that spot and got the magnifying glass, and I was right, but I'm like, I'm, I give up, so now I'm just waiting until I see the little mess on the, on the um, plant. And this just shows different in stars and how they can vary in color. So this here is my pearly everlasting. And this is pussy toes. This is a giant swallowtail. Now that's the one in the big cage. You'll see the larva in there. And um, this is, um, it can have a wingspan like between up to six inches. Most of the time mine are only between four and five inches. And these are their eggs. And this is what the caterpillar looks like. It looks like bird droppings. So that's its protection from predators, because what bird's going to want to eat that, right? <laughs> so yeah, um, that's what they look like. And they use hop tree and prickly ash. So this is my hop tree. It's a little bushier now. I've been cutting it for quite a few years. <laughs> and this is my prickly ash. This is a pearl crescent. And they lay in a cluster of eggs. And these are the uh, different instars of the Pearl Crescent, and the only thing they lay eggs on are asters. This heart-leafed aster, that's the one that I raised mine on um, several years ago. But another native one is sky blue aster. Smooth aster. And calico aster. This is a pipe vine swallowtail that has been laying me so many eggs the last two days. They're, they're really busy. They've been coming out of their chrysalis. I have some things that overwinter. I have you know quite a few species of the last brood, they overwinter, so they're in my garage in the habitats. And they've been coming out and they've been pairing. And so on my Dutchman's pipe, um, I, I've been finding lots of eggs. This one here is the male. He has an iridescent, hind, iridescent blue hind wing. Um, the female is more black. And they lay a cluster of eggs. So you see, they've been laying some eggs, so um, I have quite a few. And they feed communally, and when they get really big, then they'll be solitaire feeders. And the native plant for them is Virginia snake root.
This is my Virginia snake root. This is a morning cloak. And this one does live up to 12 months. It will overwinter in crevices of trees and pile, you know, wood piles and things. And um, so this is one of our longest living butterflies. And they lay a mass of eggs. And when they first lay them, they're like a creamy color. Then as they're developing, they turn red. And then right before they hatch, they turn black. And they feed continually or move continually. I think they have ADD. And they are the hardest thing to take a picture of because they're constantly moving. I don't even know how they can even bother eating. And I'm like, come on, I'm trying to do photography here. And um, they don't care. So these pictures are not the clearest, but you know, um, they wouldn't stop for me. So these are some of the things they lay their eggs on are birch and elm, hackberry and willow. This is my hackberry tree. And you can tell that I've been cutting it because see how it's just bushing out now. So I have lots of leaves. And this is my prairie willow. This is a question mark. And that's the name of the butterfly. On the hind wing, it has a comma with a dot that makes a question mark. So the entomologist have, you know, discovered it, gave it that name. So they'll either lay eggs singly or they'll stack them. And this just shows different in stars and they can vary in color. They will use common hops, elm, false nettle, hackberry, and nettle. This is my common hops. And this is false nettle. And this is hackberry. And this is my stinging nettle. And I keep the stinging nettle in a pot because it really, really stings bad. And but I have that because that comes up before any of the other ones do. And the question mark, um, the Eastern comma, uh, the Red Admiral, they come early in the season. The Red Admiral migrates from like down in um, Central America and it migrates up here. And the question mark in the Eastern comma, they overwinter as adults. So they're here really early in the season before anything else has come up, but this stinging nettle comes up really fast. So I keep it in a pot and when it starts getting the little seeds on it, I cut them off and get rid of them seeds so it doesn't fall on the rest of my ground because I don't, I've been stung by it and, it and it's not fun. So I'd keep an eye on that, but that way I have a plant for them to lay their eggs on before my other things come up. This is a red spot of purple. Oh, yeah, and this is the one that I have the larva um, in this small little thing, so you'll see what they look like. Well, you're going to see here in a second, anyhow. This is what they look like. Well, first, we'll show you the eggs. And they always lay on the very tip of a leaf. And when they hatch, they eat along that mid vein. So if you see a mid vein, you'll know a caterpillar is either there or it has been there. Perhaps it's been, you know, dinner for someone. but. Um, if you just see, so it eats along that mid vein, so um, that's a good sign that it's either there or had been there. And yes, this is what the caterpillars look like. They also look at bird droppings, so that's their defense. And they'll lay on aspen and cherry and cottonwood and poplars and willow. So this is my black cherry. And this here is cottonwood. And this is sandbar willow. This is a spice bush swallowtail. And these are the eggs. And you'll notice all the swallowtails, they have a round ball egg. So yeah. And these, aren't they just so darn cute? Um, 
when they're little, you know, they're brown. And then as they get bigger, they're green. And they look like they have eyes and a little, little smiley face. Um, but actually, their head is the black part that's touching the leaf. And these are just fake eye spots to trick the birds into thinking they're a tree snake. And the bird's like, I'm not going to eat him. Um, and then right before they make their chrysalis, they either turn yellow or orangish yellow. So yeah, they use sassafras and spice bush. And this is a sassafras. And this is spice bush. This is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And these are the eggs. And these caterpillars also have eye spots, but they're really small in comparison to the um, spice bush swallowtail, and they use cherry and tulip tree. So again, this is my cherry. And you can see this is as tall as my tulip tree gets, so I can use that step ladder at the end of the season. Um, and look at how it just bushes out. I have a lot of food there. This is a red admiral, and this is one you know that's migrated up in the area. However, I haven't seen one yet, but other people on my Facebook pages have, but I haven't seen it yet. And this is an egg. And these are the caterpillars. And they also use false nettle and nettle and Pennsylvania palatory and wood nettle. So again, this is my false nettle and my stinging nettle. This is a moth. This is a hummingbird clearwing. And it's diurnal, you can tell. Um, these are the eggs. And these are the different end stars. Right before it makes its cocoon, um, its back turns a brownish purplish color. And they use viburnum for a host plant. A lot of your books will say they use viburnum, snowberry, um, honeysuckle. But I did my own experiment with them. I sacrificed quite a few of them, gave them honeysuckle, gave them snowberry. They do not use it. And I do believe the people that, they'll just see it in one book and put it in another and put it in another without doing their own research. The snowberry clear wing looks almost identical, the adult, to the hummingbird clear wing. There's just a very small difference. Um, the hummingbird clearwing has white legs. The snowberry clearwing has black legs. And just a little teeny bit of difference in the um, wings. And I think they're just confused because I sacrificed quite a few and they all died. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. And I do get snowberry clearwings in my yard on my um, honeysuckle and on my snowberry. Um, so I get both of them. So. Um, in my book, you'll find that, I, I can't remember if I say, I don't remember what I say, but I do say viburnum. I might say other people might be confused or something. I don't even remember, because I wrote that a couple years ago. But um, yeah. So anyways, this is my Nana Berry. This here's my Polyphemus. And um, I had one come out, and I put her in a cage. It was a female. And she attracted a mate at night, so I have some eggs now that um, will be hatching probably in a week. And you can see the polyphemus has pretty big wingspan. That's like six inches. So it's one. I, I just love moths. I think moths are so cool, and the caterpillars are the neatest. Um, so they lay a whole bunch of eggs. And these are the caterpillars, and they feed on birch and maple and oak and willow. 
So this is my oak tree. Also, last year I put a bur oak out in my boulevard. And um, because the city ordinance is three feet, nothing bigger than three feet, but they don't count trees. But anyways, I'm gonna keep it Brenda size anyways, so I can find stuff. So I did plant a bur oak um, out of my boulevard um, last year and also a yellow birch, because that tracks a whole bunch of other moths that I wanna raise. Um, and, I, and each fall, I'll just cut them down to three feet. And you know, um, since the city doesn't count that, only your other plants, they count three feet. And of course, I use, um, this is my prairie willow. This is a cecropia. None of these guys have come out of their cocoons yet. Um, they have, you know, a good six inch weeding span too. Take questions. Okay. And um, they lay a bunch of eggs. And you can see um, they vary in size. And that last picture is with it on my hand. So it's a pretty big caterpillar. And they feed on apple and box elder, birch, cherry, dogwood, maple, and willow. So um, again, this is my cherry, and this is dogwood, and this is black willow, and this is a luna, and I have one in the cage over there. And they lay a bunch of eggs too. And these are the different instars of them, and they use hickory and sumac and sweet gum and black walnut. And this is sweet gum with a luna on it. <laughs> and this is black walnut. This is a promethea, and I have one of those in the cage. Um, I have uh, the mel in the cage, and mel is uh, the darker color. And they lay a bunch of eggs. And when they're young, they feed communally. And then as they get bigger, they feed, they're a solitaire feeder. And they'll use cherry and sassafras and spice bush and sweet gum and tulip tree. And again, this is my spice bush and my tulip tree. And this one is my. Should we leave some time for some questions? I know people. Yep, I'm, this is my last species. Perfect, perfect. Um, this is rosy maple. You can see it on my thumb. It's very little. I just love it. Um, and they lay a bunch of eggs. And you can actually see the caterpillar developing in there. Um, you can see its black head and its body. And these are the caterpillars. And they use red maple, silver maple, and sugar maple. And this is silver maple and sugar maple. And the, this is just a list of places you can buy native plants, wild type native plant nursery, the native plant nursery in Ann Arbor, Barson's Greenhouse, Hidden Savannah, and Michigan Wildflower Farm. If we want to get a copy of this, will we be able to post this on our website too for people that need that? Yeah, I will get I will get I will do that. Okay. So okay. if anybody wants a copy of this list, just reach out to us and we'll email it. Yep. And um, so we can all do our part just by planting one plant. And you know, more information, of course, is in my book. Um, it, it tells all this. So um, anyways, that's the end. And thank you so much. Any questions, please? Yeah. If you'd like to ask a question, if you could just come there so we can record you on the Zoom and get your question. So if you'd like to come up to the mic. Oh, then just scream it out, and we'll, I'll okay. repeat it. No, I just wonder if you could go back to the slide and just show the three bobbing elk feet. To show? The slide, three bobbing elk feet. The, the list. The list. Oh. Yeah, you go back oh. to the list. Okay. So, Brenda, I had a question. So, when you're collecting the eggs, so I've, I've been hesitant in my own yard to, to fool with it because I, I was worried I would damage them. What, what is the best way to collect eggs when you're bringing them into something to let them mature and not be food for predators? Okay, when, when I collect the eggs, um, if you're gentle, you can roll the egg off the um, leaf, but if you're uncomfortable with doing that, you can just pick a little piece of the leaf with it on because that leaf's gonna probably dry out before it hatches anyway, so just pick a tiny bit of it. Then um, I have a little little plastic cups with lids, and I just put them in there. You don't need any holes in the lid. There's plenty of oxygen. When the caterpillar hatches, 
then just give it um, you know, a leaf to chew on. Um, as, it gets, as it starts growing, you know, um, it eats in one end and frass comes out the other end and that's caterpillar poop. Um, so you, you wanna just empty the, cat, the frass out um, and just keep food in and when it gets bigger, then you can either buy a pot of plant and put into a habitat or you can, I, in one of them you'll see I have a cup of water and with the lid on, I poked a hole just big enough for the stem to go in, because if it's any bit bigger than that, the caterpillar will go in there and drown. And then you can put um, cut pieces of plant and put in there and then feed your caterpillars that way. But it's best to try to get eggs when you can or the first or second instar, because once they get bigger, um, predators can lay their eggs in them. And then instead of a butterfly, you'll end up with, um, you know, a pre either, you know, a, parasitic wasp or a fly or, you know, something like that. Any other questions? Just could you come up, please, so we can hear you? Thank you. I have set aside in my backyard a nice area of common milkweed. And every time I see a monarch on it, I go back and check for an egg, and I've yet to find one, and it's been 10 years. Or am I doing something wrong? Well, they're really little, um, and, and you know, if, if the flower buds are tight, look on those. Um, I would, I, you know, look underneath the leaves. Most of the time they're there, but they will lay on the top and on the stem. Um, but like I'd mentioned, on tight flower buds they'll lay, and, and just look. But they are, they're only 1 32nd of an inch, so. Yep, I, I can't find them. Like I said, I've been looking for them, so I didn't know if I was doing something wrong. No. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is that Barton's greenhouse? Do you get that butterfly? Yeah, I built that butterfly house, but I gave it to them four years ago because I got too busy to run it. So they're keeping it as a butterfly house. Yeah. That, that was well, thank you. Yeah. It's still open now, right? Correct. Um, they open. Um, what does this May? They open June. So I'm not quite sure of the date. You'd have to check with them. But I, I know I used to be open from June until September. Question. So if, you, if you're not able to save the eggs, right? So you're, the main reason of you saving is to, to save them from birds eating them? Is that? And all sorts of things eat them. I just like, if a butterfly lays an egg, usually 1% will become an adult. So if it lays 500 eggs, maybe you'll get five as adults because the rest are going to um, be eliminated by predators, um, you know, parasitic, um, parasitic um, insects will use those, uh, uh, are predators by mankind. Um, so usually only 1%. So I just like to get a few and raise them. Um, you sure don't want to raise them all because if you did, they need all the host plants and, we, and they become extinct. So, you know, it's important that a whole bunch do get eaten. Like I got some robins up on top, of, uh, right next to my door wall on top of a lamp right now. And I know she's gonna need lots of caterpillars to feed her clutch. Um, you know, so it is important, but I just like to have some and to release my yard. The question was, uh, if you have wetland, right? Um, what do you suggest that we can't plan anything there, but in the, is there anything we can put in the area for uh, uh, to attract butterflies in well, wetland area? Well, um, I don't have to deal with that, but I do know swamp milkweed, it grows in wet, it grows in uh -huh. dry, it grows in sun, and it grows in shade. It is so versatile. So I know you can do swamp milkweed there. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that because That's fine. I my yard is very dry. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. From my own experience, I have a, a wet area, and the swamp milkweed has done great. When you cut those trees back at the end of the season, do you have to check them for caterpillars? Or can, if a person had them, could they just cut the well, tree I, back? I, I do. I check them just in case. Um, but I'm doing it at the very end of the season anyways, where there's less chance. And it, I do it before there's a frost, so the frost doesn't go into the cut and kill it. So, um, you know, I, I'm doing it really late in the season where the species should be done. 
um, so I just do it before there's a chance of the frost going into the plant and killing it. So what month in Michigan do you usually do that? I usually do that the very end of September or beginning of October. I mean, so if a person didn't want to check it for all the caterpillars, they just wanted to have the food for them and cut it back at the end of the season. Yeah. yeah. Not wipe out a big population. Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We have a question in the chat. Do butterflies remember butterfly gardens from the past? Unfortunately, no, or, well, maybe fortunately, because I wouldn't be able to walk back there. I've raised thousands of, in all these years, so it, it would just be a traffic jam. So, um, unfortunately, no. Then I have a personal question. For somebody who's just getting started, and whose spouse probably will not allow me to do what you've done in your yard, what's the best plant to start with? It depends on the species you want to attract. You know, um, if you just want to focus on one species, you know, it just depends on the species. Um, easy ones are monarchs, black swallowtails, American ladies. Those are, um, those are probably the very easiest ones. But I, you know, I gave up years ago. Years ago, I used to get over 30 different species in my yard. But I, I have no idea now because I have so many different host plants. I just a huge variety of species now. But those would be your three easiest ones. So what would you plant to attract, like, say, monarchs? Milkweed. Yep. Are there any that uh, complement each other? So I started off of my own, just trying to get solely milkweed, and then I've gotten a lot of hummingbirds. And are there other butterflies and moths that, that work well with the milkweed or don't work well? Well, they'll um, the theme, you know they'll nectar on them, but um, you know it's only host plant for the uh, monarchs, right. so they will nectar on them, um, and. Any, boy, any plant, um, if you want a nectar source, I tell people if, if you go to some nursery, well, usually native plants are, you don't have to worry about that, but if you go to some nursery and you don't see any bees or anything around a plant, so many of your plants have been so genetically altered that some don't even produce nectar anymore. Um, They've been altered to change the color, to change the shape, to do this, to do that. So you might as well just put a plastic flower in your yard. Um, but um, yeah, if you see things flying around some someplace, you know that, that one's providing nectar, and that would be a good choice. Another question in the chat. Um, which butterfly is nearest to extinction? I would like to plant whatever that butterfly needs. Well, um, the monarch butterfly, right, it has been for a couple years now. Um, they're studying it, and um, they have it threatened, and they're going to be work. There's so many threatened right now that um, the federal government only works on so many each year. But from my sources, I wouldn't be surprised unless something really happens and we got to get people to plant milkweed everywhere. Uh, we need so much planted. Um, in 24, the government could list the monarch as endangered and then it would be against the law to touch an egg, a caterpillar, a butterfly if they are an endangered species. So we just need as many people to plant milkweed. It's, our numbers have drastically gone down. Um, we haven't even got the count. I'm one of the Monarch Watch Conservation Specialists, and we haven't got the count yet from Mexico, which usually we have, boy, we usually have it um, the end of February, beginning of March, but there was some political stuff going on down there. so. Um, we're expecting to get the numbers pretty soon, but our numbers have been going down. So from a very reliable source, it could happen in 2024, they could be listed endangered. So we just need 
people to plant milkweed everywhere to make corridors so that species will have something to lay their eggs on because so many of the farmers now, they um, use the Roundup uh, um, and, you know, for their soybean and corn and it, it, it doesn't affect them but it kills all the plants. And they used to have milkweed growing alongside of the plants and stuff and it's wiped out so much habitat all over. Um, I know there's a lot of um, states that um, they're working with uh, the Road Commission to put in milkweed along the strips and the highways. And so we're trying to do work throughout the whole United States, but we need a lot more hands on deck. Yes. Is uh, common milkweed a perennial or an annual? Common milkweed is a perennial. Wild though, it'll it'll take over everything if you're not careful. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then I think we're good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda, for your time, and thank you for joining us. Just as a reminder, before you take off, if you have other ideas, this lunch and learn series, uh, we're we're just getting it started again. And if you have ideas for people that you'd like to hear doing interesting things in the community, please reach out to me or Beth or anybody at the Kenton Community Foundation and uh, we'll get them scheduled. So thank you again for joining us. If anybody's interested in buying Brenda's book, she's got them over here on the side and she does take credit cards. <laughs>